Welcome to the Bookshelf Odyssey podcast. In this podcast, we talk about books, interview authors, and we discuss their journey to becoming published. Each one has a different but amazing story. My hope is to encourage people to keep reading good books and to help authors find their audience and inspire everyone in their journey, whatever that might be. Welcome to the Bookshelf Odyssey podcast. Uh, Welcome back to the Bookshelf Odyssey podcast. My name is Art, and today I have a guest author on, uh, Mary Kendall, and she is the author of Bottled Secrets of Rosewood. After an archaeological dig at Rosewood, Miranda's historic house, unearths an ancient blue bottle of questionable origin. It seems to trigger the occurrence of inexplicable and mysterious events. While Brian, the head archaeologist, and his team try to figure out the mystery behind the blue bottle, disturbing encounters with the local folks leave Miranda shaken and unsure of the isolated coastal corner of Virginia where she has moved. And that's all I'll, I'll say about the book other than uh, it is it is a good read and I would recommend that if you're wanting a, a good, mysterious book to uh, to be reading this time of year. And so I'm excited to get to know Mary a little bit more. And uh, Mary, welcome to the Bookshelf Odyssey podcast. Thank you so much, Art, for having me on today. And I've been looking forward to having this chat and um, talking more about books. What I, I've loved getting to, to know the authors and the stories behind their stories. Uh, it's true. Yeah, it's been it's been fun. Um, so I'm excited to get to know you because there are some things in your bio I'm going to have to ask questions about. So, <laughs> okay, feel free. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, before we get there, uh, do you have any books you'd like to recommend, or what are some of your favorite things to read? Well, I really like to say that I read across the genres. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that means I'm really open to reading a lot of different genres. And um, that would include memoirs, um, really into that genre. And then also I'll throw in the classics here and there. Um, Historical fiction is kind of one of my mainstays because I write historical fiction also. And then my, um, probably my go-tos though, are psychological thrillers Mm -hmm. and mysteries. And I can see your bookshelf behind you there. Mm-hmm. And I see one of my favorites, Louise Penny. Yep. So uh, not only am I into psychological thrillers of, of um, this side, North America, but I'm also a big fan of British authors. I'll throw one out, Ellie Griffith. She wrote the Ruth Galloway series, which I love, love, love. There's about 13 mm-hmm. in that. And recently, last week, I finished up, uh, she started writing cozy mysteries. So I'll even venture off. And mm-hmm. she she wrote her most recent is called The Last Word. Very well done. Uh, along the lines of American authors, we've got Mary Kubica, Sherry Lapina. I mean, there's there's just so many. And like you, I read a lot. Mm. So I have the opportunity to to really um, get into all of it. Another book I read, just to throw it out there, I was uh, really impressed. Christine Blazy Ford came out with her memoir mm. recently, and I was just blown away by it. Real, really skillfully done. And I'll tell you, after being in the writing business for a while, I often read now with one eye on craft mm. and really kind of soaking up what these authors that I like and I'm drawn to are doing in terms of craft. And so I'm kind of like at two level. Of course, I do it for enjoyment because I love it. But also, I'm also always keeping an eye on how they're doing it, what they're doing, and what's effective. And in some cases, what's not. Now, I will say my um, my true background and what I kind of cut my teeth on uh, were gothic thrillers. So going back to Mary Stort, mm-hmm. Phyllis Whitney was a favorite. Barbara Michaels have a whole bunch of favorites. And I'll still pick those up. Those, those are kind of like my um my popcorn or my candy i'll go back to those and read those yeah so i think maybe that answers your question oh, very well yeah okay. <laughs> some of those i haven't heard of so i'm gonna be uh adding them for sure to check them out yeah yes if you i think if you're a louise penny fan which mm-hmm. it looks like you are mm-hmm. and you've never read ellie griffiths you really look her up start okay. with the first ruth galloway novel Ruth is an archaeologist 
in set it's set in Norfolk and in, in England. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big Anglophile. So part of it is setting for me. I love the settings over there. Scotland, England, Wales, you know, yeah. Ireland, all of those settings just really pull me in too. Yeah. Louise Penny is one of those authors that both my wife and I enjoy. Yeah. And when there's a new one out, we we buy it, you, you know. Yeah. You have to fight um, each other, you have to fight each other to who's gonna read it first, probably. Um no, I you know, I I've learned just to let her read them first. <laughs> She's a faster reader than I am. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being a gentleman. <laughs> there you go. What did but, you think of the film renditions? Uh, um, oh, oh yeah. That, that series one. with, um, uh, what's his name that was in it? Al um, Alfred Millet Melanera. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then there was one done years ago, about 10 years back. Okay. Yeah, um, I didn't see that one. the 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 films that came out a few years ago, I I saw the the one that was a TV show a series. Yeah. Um, I thought the the movies that they made or whatever it was, I thought it was really just miscast. I agree. I was not. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it gets back to that age old question: What's better, the book or the movie? Yeah. And it just feels like ninety nine point nine percent of the time, it's the book. Right. Yeah. The series. I actually watched because um, I, uh, I I really enjoy that the main the, the actor they chose and I thought that was a good choice. Yeah, you know they did make some changes from the books and uh, as they're going to, which I thought were some interesting changes. Uh, really, you know, it it just it misses the book. <laughs> For me, and, the most yeah. I'm a big fan of setting as character, mm -hmm. not only as a writer but as a reader. And that setting of her books in Three Pines. Mm -hmm is just i had it all in my head so different mm -hmm. the way they did it and i think that set me off right at the start i just i just had it totally imagined in a different way yeah but you know that that actually speaks to who we are as readers and writers you know what i mean right. we're bringing our individual experience to whatever we're reading and yeah it's interesting like that yeah uh but yeah i thought the actor did a, a great job as gamash you know he he had the um the the gentleness and the um he was very Softness. thoughtful and sh and yet yeah. sharp yeah I and agree. I agree. yeah without yeah. it being a, a silly but uh you know he just it was a fine line that he just really yeah, i thought he, he did, did a great well. job um yeah. it's it's always hard when you <laughs> adapt you know a, a much beloved series or yeah. book it's a tall order for anybody yeah. to try that for sure um yeah have you read Alan Bradley's series. The first book is called The Sweetness at the Bottom of the Pie. Hmm. And I write it down then. The Sweetness at the Bottom of the Pie. Yeah. Alan Bradley. American, Canadian. Uh, it's uh it, he's Canadian. Main character's name is Flavia De Luz. Oh, okay. And she's I want to say about 12 or 13 years old, but it's not like a YA book. Um uh, not not that those are bad. It's it takes place in like the 1950s England and she's like this incredible genius chemist. She has her own laboratory and everything. And and so she, she has these like books. Like a child prodigy? Yeah. Kind of? kind of like a child prodigy in chemistry. And she lives with her dad and two sisters. There's um, a butler there. Her mom had died under some mysterious circumstances earlier. And right now there's about 10 books in the series. Oh. Um, and they're just really good. Um, I'm look it up. Definitely. That sounds yeah. right in my alley. And by the way, I should have added young adult to my mm -hmm. reading um, recommendations because actually my second novel is um, kind of borderline young adult. It's a coming of age historical fiction tale. Mm -hmm. And that said, if I find a story that I like and it's, it's YA, that's great. Bring it. Yeah. I was, I was really surprised by a Netflix, not to keep talking about films, but <laughs> that's right. Uh, there's a Netflix that just came out. It's called The Good Girl's Guide to Murder. Mm -hmm. And the author of the book was Holly Jackson. And uh, I just fell into it. It's it's a done in you know, the setting. Once again, it's Britain, a really cool little town and everything. And it was fantastic. Six episodes. Sure. And then I looked into like the writer afterwards. I need to get a copy of the book because I reached out. I have a 14 year old niece. And I was like, hey, I got I found this great film. And she was like, I've seen it and the books are even better. I've read all the books. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's, it's uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've read those books. Um, oh, you have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think you recommend. 
Oh yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. definitely. Yeah, I gotta um, get my hands on those stuff. Yeah. <laughs> the characters in the um Flavia de Luz books are, are just so interesting. So well done. Yeah, very well done. It, it's like a, a family that's been broken by by death, by war. You know, it's it's post-World War II mm-hmm. England. Mm-hmm. Um but she is such a a plucky character, but she's got a little darkness to her too. I I've, I I tell people it's like Wednesday Adams, but mm-hmm. not quite as dark, you know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. it it it's borderline at times. Uh, yeah. But oh, definitely, that, that sounds like I said right up my alley. And yeah. also, like we were talking about earlier, I love when I find something that I can study the craft of it. Like you said, right. the characterization is yeah. really good. You know, I, I would love to read it for that right there. Yeah, one of the book endings just broke my heart. And, uh, and oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, that means it worked. The book That's worked. That's right. Yeah. Happens. Yeah. There's some book recommendations. I guess if we're not careful, we'll just sit here and recommend <laughs> books all day. <laughs> I can be a chatty Kathy. Yeah. So you better ring me in. Well, yeah, same, same. Uh, I, I just, I love finding people who love to read. And yep. it's like the majority of my conversations with people. You yeah. Know? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about your book. What's it about, and uh, what can we expect in it? Okay, so I like to say that all of my fiction. This is my third published novel, and I like to say that all of my fiction is historically inspired. Mm-hmm. And so, my first two novels are historical fiction. The first was historical mystery. The second one, as I mentioned, was coming of age historical fiction. And this one has been billed as a contemporary gothic thriller but that said the inspiration for it came from an article that i just happened to read in the washington post back in january uh i don't know if you can see this january 2020 Mm -hmm. and it was about a archaeology dig outside of williamsburg virginia where they found a blue bottle Mm-hmm. They did more research on it, and they found it to be a witch bottle. So that's a real-life story about a historical find, and that's the kind of thing that pulls me right in. So I clipped out the article, I set it aside, and then um, some time went on, and suddenly it was summer 2020, and we had a lockdown summer. Mm-hmm. And like everybody else, I needed to find something to focus on, something to put my mind to. And I was ready for a new project because I had wrapped up my my the one I'd been working on. So I literally started writing this story almost four years ago to the day, mm. which gives you which gives you a little bit of a timeline of how these things can uh, can take to gestate. Right. So anyway, um, I had that like I said, I had the germ of the idea. And I wanted to learn more about witch bottles. So I did the research first. And really, there's not that much research that has been done on them. Mm-hmm. So I found out what I could. And then I also had, I used the setting where the real life bottle was found because it's a setting that's familiar to me. I went to college in Virginia and I spent a lot of time down in that area, which is Tidewater, Virginia. So immediately when I started writing, I, I had that world in my head of what I wanted to do. And you know, one thing, one page led to another. And then I soon had, I had my book mm. and, uh, yeah. And since it's funny, since then, since I went through the whole process of finding a publisher, working on the cover, working on the trail, all the things that make a book come together, I started, I was working so closely with the project that I started thinking, oh, this is a really weird story. And I wonder mm-hmm. if it's because of that time, that summer 2020 was a very weird time. Mm-hmm. Did that spill over and, and, you know, become part of this? And I guess I, I guess I have to leave that to the reader to judge rather than myself. <laughs> yeah. I said at the time, uh, I had said, I am really interested to see what kind of creative projects come out of this time period. And I've been glad to see that it wasn't just all doom and gloom. I mean, there is a lot of it, but. That's right. I mean, that you know, there's, yeah. There, I got my first publishing contract December, 2020. I've been working years towards that and it happened during that bad, bad time, you know? So, right. You know, life went on. Yeah. Yeah, it did. And I'm always glad when something good could come out of a bad time, you know, I agree. I agree. Uh, and it's, 
I, I think we'll still see more. I mean, here it is. Can't believe almost four years later now <laughs> and yeah. people are still saying, I, I started this during the pandemic and I started writing during this time, you know, and, yeah. uh, or, you know, I hear I had something tragic happen in my past. So to deal with it, I, I started writing and, exactly. uh, yeah. And they were able to, um, do something good out of that. Right. Um, right. Yeah. It did in a weird way, free up people's time. Right. It, it kind of changed up the hustle and bustle and the daily grind and all that so that people maybe were able to tap into parts of themselves that they, they would not have been able to do mm -hmm. in regular times. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Let's turn the clock back a few years more here. And uh, I, I mentioned on your bio that it said that you grew up in old and haunted houses and that it, that sparked a lifelong interest in history and storytelling. Yeah. Um, what, what is that all about? What, what did you, what did you uh, come across and see there that inspired that young writer in you? So at a young age, like I said, I was about eight mm -hmm. and I grew up in suburban Maryland outside of DC. So I, I grew up a kid, a kid of the suburbs mm -hmm. and my parents did a, a quick plot twist on us and decided they wanted to move out to the country. And they found a an old house to buy on a lot of land that was very run down and needed to be rehabilitated. And it, they moved to an area where, it, like I said, it was in the country and it was still set up as it sort of was 200 years earlier. There were just farms and old houses peppered throughout the landscape. And so immediately as they started working on the house all these stories came out about the history of the area the history of the specific house the family that lived in the house had family houses too so mm -hmm. there was just all these stories and uh i guess it, it captured my imagination now i don't know if that's that's because the kind of person i was or if it would have happened anyway i don't know but like I said, things happened along the way as they were restoring the house that that just doubled down on that. Um, for instance, they were restoring the mantelpieces, which were really like historic artifacts. They were that old, mm -hmm. about 200 years old. And they moved the mantelpiece off to to work on it and old love letters spilled out. Oh, wow. With a with a uh, antique hat pin. Mm -hmm. And the love letters were from a girl that had lived there who whose boyfriend or beau lived in the farm behind the house and there was an old farm road through the cornfield that you could still get to that house so you could start to picture how that how that worked mm -hmm. and uh it really just stuck with me and then um they continued my parents continued to do that so that was that was one house and then they continued to buy other houses and do the same mm. That story just, well, sends chills down my back. When my grandfather died, we were going through his house and we found his old letters that he and my grandma wrote to each other during World War II. Mm. And they were, it was just a really sweet thing to find. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. And it conjures up a whole world, a whole right. world you didn't know about. Right. Yeah. And hadn't um, imagined even. Yeah. He, he, you know, yeah. He talks about, you know, getting a chance to meet her during, you know, his, um, not shore leave, but, you know, during his, uh, time, he, vacation time, you know, and they planned to meet. Yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. Um, they both were in the Philippines. Um, you know, she was a nurse in the mm. army and uh, just a really That's fun, sweet. beautiful story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I can see where that would just start getting those creative juices flowing. It, for it sure. really did. It really did. And it stuck with me. And a lot, in fact, a lot of, I still in my writing, every now and then you drop a Easter egg of something that happened back mm -hmm. in those days when I was a child. It mm -hmm. was that, it was that memorable. It really mm -hmm. was. You know, as a teenager, I loved reading stories about like haunted houses and ghost stories and, you know, UFO mm -hmm. stuff. And, and not that I necessarily believed it, but people said, this experience happened to me. You know, I can't explain it. And I, I liked that level of inexplicability if that's the right way if that's a word yeah, even. Right. you know it just inspired my imagination you know that hey yeah. there's maybe you know things in our world that we don't understand yes and i'm here yeah. for it <laughs> me too 
Yeah. And also you kind of touched on another aspect of my writing, talking mm-hmm. about the letters between your grandparents, mm-hmm. because that has been another inspiration for my first two novels. And my fourth is about to come out February. It's also for the fourth uh, family history and mm-hmm. family stories. And I have, I, I've, as a historian, I really got into genealogy at a young age. Uh, so I was hanging out with all the blue haired ladies when I had still had my dark hair. But anyway, that that is something I've done for years and years and years. And you can't make up the stories I come across. You really can't. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it has just been an amazing resource, a well of potential ideas for novels. So like when you told me, when you were talking about your grandparents' love letters, my mind immediately went to the twisty part of that, which was, oh, but what if you had found your grandfather's letters to his other girlfriend? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) That's kind of the story that I tend to write, to be honest with you. I go Uh, for the, like the little bit off center, the little twist that's, that tends to be me. Yeah. No, I, I, I didn't read a lot of his letters. I, I, I don't know. I still felt like it was maybe a bit private. Yeah. You feel but, like a voyeur when you right. find this stuff. Yeah. I know that uh, we read a couple that were really sweet, but I remember reading one where he said he was, he was going to be um, uh, on getting some R and R in Hawaii or, or one of the islands that they would be at. And, and I remember him saying now, no, you don't have to worry about me and all the pretty island girls here. Like, <laughs> I'll I'll stay true to you and all that. And I'm like, yeah. well, why would you even need to say that? Yeah, right. Yeah, that part out, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was at that point. I'm like, you know what? I don't know if I want to read these yeah, right now. <laughs> I don't need to read any more here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was neat because it opened up a side of him that I I didn't know. You yeah. know, uh, which you know maybe uh you know hundred years from now you know my my descendants will be watching my old videos and. And so, yeah. um, hello to any descendants, you know, <laughs> Hi, We're here. I, I am a perfectly normal person. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Let's get it on record. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So you ended up uh, pursuing a history uh, degree and, um, I did. it looks like, yeah. yeah. And what, it, what is it that you studied? So, you know, it, it, it's funny because the minute I could start to read, reading was just my love. That was my love affair from a young age on. And I always thought when I got to college, I would be an English major. Mm -hmm. And I got to college and I was like taking the classes and I was really not that jazzed about, you know, the critical analysis and things like that, Mm -hmm. that you had to do. And I also always loved history. So I started looking into the history departments in my at my college, and they had something called historic preservation, which meant that I could study old buildings. So that kind of fell mm-hmm. right in line mm-hmm. with what I had experienced as a child. And so then I was like, oh, I'll do both English. I'll be a double major, English and historic preservation. Mm-hmm. Well, the English fell to the wayside and I became a historic preservation major. And then after that, I went to graduate school and got a, a degree that complemented that in, a, in what was called American culture. And so my career was large as a historian was largely largely related to the built environment, to buildings, bridges, mm-hmm. things like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I loved it. And, it. and it was great. It was a way to kind of use my passion for something and use it as a job to earn a living at the same time. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to me, that's gotta be the best matchup when you're doing something you love exactly. and you get paid for it. <laughs> you know? exactly. My my wife and I both enjoy like doing the, the tours of, of old houses and things. Yeah. Um, uh, that There was one we went to um, and I forget it's, it's in Nebraska and it, it's the house that of uh, the guy who started Arbor day, Anyway, they had his house there. You could tour and it was, it was really neat. Um, that's, yeah. I think that's the last time we've gone to one. Um, I'll tell you what's really cool, which I really, mm-hmm. I, I love going to old houses, all house museums, but house museums where writers lived mm-hmm. takes it up a notch. Love that. I think, do you have Willa Cather's house in Nebraska somewhere? I think you're right. I haven't somewhere. been there though. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she started out in the East near me in Virginia. 
um, but they don't have any, they have a plaque where she was born or whatever, but they don't have a house museum. I think our house museum is out there, but um, I went to Zane Gray's house oh, in Del. That yeah. was fascinating. I mean, yeah. fascinating. They had a carriage house in the back where his, mm -hmm. his mistress stayed. Oh, <laughs> wife was in the main house. Mistress hung out in the back and uh, didn't know that about Zane Gray. I did not. I, I know now. <laughs> exactly. Well, like you, when we oh, wow. started the podcast, you said the story behind the stories. Right. And I'm I, like you. I'm really like I. I love to find out those cookies. What went down? Yeah. Um, Ernest Hemingway's house in Key West. Mm -hmm. Very memorable. Highly mm -hmm. recommended. So yeah, it it all it all kind of comes full circle. All ties together. Yeah, I I know. I want to I want to get to England sometime and and do uh, like see the the bronte parsonage and uh, uh, shakespeare shakespeare yeah. dickens's house yeah. um, well another place that i've been really wanting to get which i hear endlessly is is just the most amazing place oxford mississippi faulkner country okay the whole town is supposed to be you know bookstores and all, oh. all about books and then his house i think it's called rowan forest is supposed to be amazing Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm jotting these ideas down yeah. here. Uh, oh, it's, it's, oh uh, actually, yeah. yes. And speaking of which I did fulfill uh, a bucket list dream, a writer's house. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a big, big fan. And she was a big influence on me. Mary Robert Reinhardt. Okay. I, I'm sorry. Mary Reinhardt Roberts. I always get that mixed up. She was a mystery writer. And in her day in America in the early 20th century, she rivaled Agatha Christie in terms of her sales and her mysteries. Right. And she had to become a writer because her husband died and she needed to make a living. And her, her books are just amazing. Uh, the circular staircase is one. There's, there's a lot of them, but anyway, yeah. I had always read about once she became um, best-selling novelist and made money, she bought an Island in Florida off the Gulf coast. And mm -hmm. she, um, own this entire island it's called cabbage key have you been no uh but that's that's that would be a dream yes. dream house so yeah <laughs> i got to go to florida it was my good fortune to go to florida this past february mm -hmm. it's a big deal to get out there you got to pay a lot to get a boat ride and all this and my husband and i went out to cabbage key and it was fantastic wow. I loved it um it's also known for the fact that supposedly Jimmy Buffett wrote Cheeseburger in Paradise because of the cheeseburger they sell there. Mm. So it's kind of a kind of a twofer there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, but it was just it just, it just so atmospheric. You could just pick. They still have the little you know the historic house set up where she did her writing, her little office. It, it was fantastic. It's it's I love mm. it. Love yeah. it. Yeah. I I that her name was familiar, and I I looked up her books here but i i haven't read any of them i i really um, if you're if so, you're like you are into the genre if you, yeah. if you are again you know mistress of the craft you read her stuff and you're like wow mm -hmm. how did she do it uh, yeah yeah i'm finding that to be real uh, more and more interesting how um history has lost people like her you know, because they're, they're focused yeah. on agatha christie and, and exactly. i mean rightly so i mean she this. she's a good writer but Hey, there's somebody else doing the same thing. Maybe better, maybe not. I don't know, exactly. but you know, they they lost exactly. lost her. Um, I also I can't remember their names now, but there were some other mystery mysteries I read that were similar to Sherlock Holmes, but it, it was written by women before Sherlock Holmes and Edgar Allan Poe. There was another uh, uh, was lady. Mary, there was one Mary Rollins Croft. I forget the last name. Might, might be. Yeah. I think uh, you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. There, there was um, another who um, wrote about a, a female detective. Um, I think that the first story was called the female detective and, and it was written around either uh, late 1900, 1800s, early 1900s um, mm -hmm. that there were, they were interesting. Oh, that one was actually by a man. Okay. Andrew Forrester. I wonder if that was a pen name now. For some reason, I thought that was a it could be a lot a of them. A lady, that. lady writer. Yeah. Well, no, that pens. that yeah, that was a that was a man 
author. I think oh. the one about that was um, he wrote a, a female character, but like didn't have her fall in love and get married. You know, like if she was an independent. Also, also would be unusual, right? To assign a female an actual job, right? Right. A career had, like that. A career yeah. agency and yeah, was content. That, that would have um, been cutting edge for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I get reading so much, I, I lose track of author names. I know. <laughs> I'll try I, to. I'm uh, same, and then I feel like kind of like, oh, come on. I, I swear. Better. To, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Remember them, you know. Right. Um, That's what Goodreads is good for. That, like, yeah. I, 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 I try to keep up with Goodreads here and there, and and put reviews up to keep track of everything I've read. Yeah, I would love to check out some of these author homes. Um, yeah, I, I think I that's it, really. I call it pilgrimages. Pilgrim. <laughs> yeah. My wife and I both. You know, we we love the classics. I, I especially love Victorian classics, and we feel like if we ever got a chance to go to England, it would very much feel like a pilgrimage to <laughs> to some holy land or something. Oh yeah, and I mean, <laughs> you'd need you'd need a month, yeah, to, or or longer to yeah. really to really cover it. So, well, that's a that's a bucket list, I guess. All right. Well, and then uh, talk a little bit about your. I guess your uh, your first book you had you you had mentioned to me before we recorded that it's coming out again this mid October. My debut came out in April 2021, mm-hmm. and unfortunately, the publisher has recently uh, determined they have to shut down, and and they'll be no longer active as of the end of September. So, fortunately for me. I had already started working on a sequel for this one mm-hmm. and almost had it wrapped up when they made this announcement. <laughs> so back in April, I quick scrambled around looking for a home, not only for, for my one that was going to disappear, my debut, but also this follow-up sequel. And uh, I'm ha- very happy to announce that Bloodhound Books will be publishing my debut as its second a- second edition, which means new cover. And also the sequel will come out in February and the working title on that right now is Mrs. O'Keefe's gold. And that's, uh, will be out hopefully mid October. So you said mid October. Now I, I did something that at the time I didn't know would be a good idea. I did my own audio book of that Mm -hmm. So because of that, it's still active as an audio book to, if anybody's interested to take a look at, if you've got audible, I think I remember, uh, I saw that it was on, audible but it wasn't available anywhere else so right and i was like oh that's weird but okay that explains that mystery then okay (laughs) that's it it. yeah i dabbled into that uh early on with that one Uh, and i'm glad uh, now because that means it if if that weren't the case it would there'd be no nothing no evidence that it ever existed right so yeah is that an experience you'd want to repeat reading your own book or so i didn't read it i actually acted as uh the producer Mm -hmm. which meant that i went through the audible process where you can uh, you can have people um if they're interested audition to whether they want to read it or not that that was a whole new world and that's that's a lot of a lot of what my writing my publishing experience has been it's really open doors like that that i never even thought of i Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that was a part of it Mm -hmm. um working with graphic arts like i've i've basically been involved heavily with all of my book covers and i love it Mm -hmm. and i didn't know that was something that i would ever be interested in so anyway the audible was like that and i acted as a producer of it and it was an interesting process but i did not read it myself i was very lucky in that a classically trained actress who studied at northwestern university decided to take it on and i think she did a wonderful job I love audiobooks. It's Ooh, there it's you go. Pick how, up, pick up Sister's Fortune if you can. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's how I can get through so many books in a year. <laughs> so what's funny about that is I'm not a fan. Oh really? I'm okay. I'm also really not fond of ebooks and Kindle. Mm-hmm. It, for me, there's just something about the old fashioned holding the book like this. Mm-hmm. That's 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 me. And I'm, uh, you know, I, when COVID, when the lockdown started, um, all the stuff started happening. And then the finale was, and the libraries are closing. And mm. that was like, no, 
you can't take that away from me. And right. of course, I had to use my Kindle pretty much for the first time. I was, like mm -hmm. I said, I'm not a fan. Don't really enjoy that reading experience. But I did turn to Kindle and, you know, I appreciate it for what it is. Mm. Definitely. Yeah, I I don't mind it. And, and I've read some books on it, but it, I, I would say the majority lately of books I'm reading are audio books. Okay. Um, and that's partly because my life has been too busy, I think. But yeah. so do um, you, when you listen to the audio books, mm -hmm. are you multitasking, like walking or cooking? Yeah. Because um, I think that's part of my problem. If unless I was driving on a long, boring drive, I don't think I would be able to pay attention because right. I'd be doing something else. Right. Yeah. If I have to drive somewhere, um, you know, we, we live out in a rural rural community. So driving, Do a lot of driving. long, long distances just to go to the grocery store. Oh, wow. And so, I, you know, I'll listen to when I'm driving. Um, I've got a hyperactive dog needs walking a lot. Uh -huh. So I'll take her that. for a walk. Listen uh, that way. I'll even I have a couple of computer games that are pretty mindless that I'll I'll play and then listen to an audio book. But I got to be careful in that because sometimes I'll get too focused on too caught up in the story. Yeah, uh, yeah, either the story or the computer or game, either one. What you're and then, doing, right? One like, or the oh, other. Oh, I did, I just heard a, two chapters and I have no idea what happened. Uh, so, yeah, um, that, that's what I would worry about. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to do everyday life at the same time as listen to the story. But uh, the best thing, really, still is just sitting in my chair in the early morning, drinking coffee and reading a book. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I hear you. Um, so as as we get uh, wrap up here, um, do you have any tips or words of encouragement you'd give to people who might want to be a writer or have been trying? Oh, yeah, so so many. I guess to to hit the high note, and maybe at the risk of sounding a little harsh, if you want to be a writer, the deal is the world isn't out there clamoring waiting for you to be a writer. It has to be something you want and if you want to do it you've got to do it yourself mm. you've got to pull yourself up and make it happen and that's not easy and along the way i've come across a lot of folks that are like yeah i have a book in mind and this that and the other and and that's great but mm -hmm. you're gonna have to make it happen and there's lots of ways to do that and we could uh, we would go on for another couple hours with tips right. how to do that but the main thing is you've got to put in the time. Yeah. It's not going to happen otherwise. You've got to put it put in the time and make it happen. Uh, and then I guess the other thing is because as of December, it will be four years for me as being a published author. Mm -hmm. now, I wrote for years and years and years before that, before anything um, came out in the world. So the writing part is different from the business part of writing. So that's, but it's something you have to do. Mm -hmm. So I guess the other writing tip is realize that that business part is, is going to be a learning curve and you're going to go through it and have to kind of navigate your way. And for me, it's been a thing of really trying to hone in on what do I want to concentrate on here? What, what do I feel is a good um, return on my investment of time and energy? And then on top of that, what do I, what do I really have fun with? And I love about this part of it. Like mm -hmm. I was mentioning the book covers, love them. Mm -hmm. I've done book trailers, love them. So I really try to try to make sure I keep it as fun as possible while I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's both hand in hand, the, the writing part and the business part. So that's that's what you're doing when you are a writer. And also, I here's a here's something I wish I had known. Start to think about what what your goal is and why you want to be a writer and why you want to do this. At the end of the day, what what is it you're looking for out of this? Mm. Now, that can change along the way, certainly, but I think a lot of people maybe get too short-sighted and think I'm going to go into it and I'm going to be a best-selling New York Times author. That's me. Mm -hmm. When you set that bar, you maybe set yourself up um, not for failure, but for kind of like, oh, I've got to rescale this and really think about what I want to, 
what I want to get out of it. And for me, my goal has, has become enough. It's enough for me that I'm able to figure out a way of getting my, my words out in the world and read. That's enough. It, it's, you know, not, not to crush anyone's dreams, but you're probably not going to be the next Stephen King, you know, <laughs> I mean, and that's okay. Yeah. That's we, okay. You know, we, we've got Stephen King, you know, you need to be who you yeah. are. Right. And yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, I remember, I think uh, a previous guest had, had kind of had a similar thought about uh, they had said, uh, you know, you just got to put your butt in the chair and do it. <laughs> I'm a big believer in the butt and chair method. Yeah. You know, you have to have it. Of course it's, it's, it's inspiration. It's some talent, but it's also that discipline. Yeah making it happen, putting in the time, doing the work. Yeah. I like, I like that though. Um, you know, knowing why you want to do it, yeah. there, there have been similar things I, I've learned about like podcasting, you know, they, that's one of the things they'll say is you, you got to know why you're wanting to do it yes. um, because if it's to, to make money off of ad revenue, then you're going to fail <laughs> probably yeah. because you know, they, they compare it to some of the, you know, the big mega YouTubers and, mm -hmm. and podcasters that have millions and millions of downloads a month. Right. And right. that's like the top half of 1%, yeah. you know, and, and, and you can get so caught up in that yeah. idea, but then if you step back and think, well, wait a minute, do I want to do it? Cause it's really enjoyable to me mm -hmm. and it's really become rewarding because I've met this person or that person, or I learned about this or so, something like that. There's so many tangential benefits that have come to me yeah. in this experience that, like I said, I, I would have never even imagined them. I would have never right. even known that, that I could work on things about this that I've, that I've been working on. Um, one time, I did a podcast a couple of years back with a guy who was one of those experts. He had been mm -hmm. trained and all this, and he was really schooling me to the point of my voice didn't sound right. And he was telling me what to do and all this. We worked for hours together. And the end result was he had me in my hallway closet with the door closed and I had blankets and covers over me with a special mic. <laughs> and, later, and later now it's now i'm laughing about it but at the time i was like what am i doing you know <laughs> how has it come to this but it's just you know along the way like everything else like you navigate your way take some wrong turns yes of course and i will still take wrong turns but after four years i'm building up on, on the experience and knowing maybe knowing where are the right turns to take because keep this train going and i want to keep the train going that's that's my goal i yeah. want to keep the train going if i can yeah making those connections with with your audience i know has it, got to be just you know this is great i've touched yeah. somebody's life or i've kept them up at night reading yes. <laughs> exactly that's like this this bottled secrets came out and i yeah. got a couple comments like we're jaw I, my jaw dropped i had two readers say a page turner and I was like, really? Wow. Mm. That's wow. I didn't know that. I love it. Grateful. I'm very grateful. Pursuing what you love. There's just nothing better. Um, whether That's it makes makes you money or not, it doesn't matter. Yeah. That's to be honest. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to wax ph philosophical here, but, you know, do what you love because life really is short. Uh, yeah. You know, just. Yeah. And we see that every day. Oh, yeah. And yeah. If we don't get that message. Yeah, that hammer's on our head telling us, but if we don't um, take heed, well, you know, yeah. we can lose out. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Uh, well, Mary, this has been a, a great conversation here. I, I feel like I could just talk all day about books and too. writing. I, I, I love really it. It's been fun. It'll tell folks where they can find you online uh, if they want to order your books and see what you got. So I, I like to make my website kind of my hub. And you can go to my website and find everything. It's www.marykendallauthor.com. Pretty easy to remember. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, I am I try to be at all the places. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Threads. Uh, I, Amazon, of course, you can pick up the books. But um, my second two novels, they can be purchased wherever books are sold. So wherever your favorite bookstore sells mm -hmm. books, you should be able to pick them up. But again, you can find all that information on my website for sure. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And if you, you can't find it, I know um, your, your local libraries would be happy to order it for, for readers. Okay. Um, books, local bookshops would be happy to order for you. So yes, definitely. Um, I mean, I buy from Amazon probably too much <laughs> more than I should, but I know it's, yeah. it, we all fall into the, into the zone. That yep. trap. That's right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, just uh, reach out to your favorite bookseller. They'll, they'll be happy to do business with yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, well, Mary, best of luck to you and in, in all the projects you have coming up. I uh, would love to have you back on again sometime. Oh, that'd be great. I'd love it. I'd love all it. Right. And thank you for all the recommendations. I got a whole long list now. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> it's in my TBR. It's That's my right. TBR list. Well, well, uh, I'll I'll try to list uh, as many of those as I can in our show notes, and okay, uh, folks can look there for them. Um, and so, uh, until next time, thanks for joining us, Mary. Appreciate it. And uh, and for everyone else, happy reading. Thank you for listening to the Bookshelf Odyssey podcast. You can check out the show notes to find out all the information, links, and in books that we referenced in today's episode. If you'd like to help support the show, I'd love for you to share on your social medias, tell your bookworm friends, share with your author friends, and help us get the word out. If you'd like to help out in a financial way, there are links in the show notes. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com. You can find all episodes at bookshelfodyssey.com. And please follow us on my social medias. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Follow us there for more bookish content. And so until next time, happy reading, everyone, and take care.